Good morning, friends, and welcome to Community United Church of Christ, where we are growing spiritually, sharing God's love, and serving others. Um, today's service is designed for the third Sunday of Advent 2020. Um, uh, what's that, the 13th? Do I have that right? December 13th. But the date doesn't matter because the Spirit is alive and well every single day of all eternity. Amen. And as we celebrate this Advent season, this time where we are remembering Christ coming into the world, we pray that today um, Christ would be born in your life, in your situation, wherever it is that you find yourself this morning. May God's blessings pour out upon you. You probably, hopefully anyway, got a phone call this week um, with my voice on it uh, about Christmas Eve. Um, Consistory did vote to move forward with a very limited Christmas Eve service. Um, it's going to look very different than previous years, obviously. Um, the plan as it stands right now, and I have to reiterate once again, and I've said this since March, all plans are subject to change. We will be in touch if anything changes. I am keeping my finger on the pulse of just about every metric you can imagine for um, this health crisis that we're in. But should we move forward with it, what it would look like is we will be here in the sanctuary for uh, roughly about 15 minutes. Masks are required, distancing is required, and uh, when you arrive, there'll be about a 15 minute or so service of storytelling of the Christmas story with some pre-recorded music. We won't be singing along. We know that choral singing is really dangerous. Um, we will then proceed down one of these steps, um, haven't quite figured out the logistics yet, and go out to the pavilion, weather permitting, um, to outdoors, light a candle as best as we can, and sing Silent Night out under the stars. Um, and so the whole service will take 20, 30 minutes at most, so that we can then have time to clean the space for the next group to come in. Uh, the services are every hour starting at 6. You can go to our website, communityucc.net, to sign up, because space is limited to 25 people per service. If those three services fill up, we'll get in touch with us and we'll, we're, we'll try to figure something else out. Um, again, we'll be in touch as we get closer in case things change, but that is the plan as it is right now. Um, also, you should have seen in your email that I sent out a link with all of the Christmas carols that we recorded uh, two days ago. In, uh, in this place. We have 13 voices total, so it sounds like a real choir because it is a real choir. Um, I'll be putting out a video with that, some sing-alongs. You'll hear some of those carols in the service today and everyone afterwards. We're gonna try to inundate with music. Actually, today, in about an hour, we'll be recording our cantata, which will then be next Sundays. And so um, there will be a lot of music coming up. And today's service is all about music. And so I hope that the, the, the Christmas music is able to lift your spirits in the way that it's able to lift mine. So would you join me in a word of prayer this morning as we begin? Dear Lord, we rejoice in your coming um, to this earth. We thank you for your faithfulness, your love, um, to, to us, how small we are, yet you count every hair on our head. We pray that you would fill whatever space that we are in, just as you fill us with your most Holy Spirit this day, that we might know you afresh and feel your presence in new ways. In your name, amen. Uncontainable, irrepressible, bubbling up in an explosion of energy, what the weary long for, what children often embody, what makes the divine smile. Joy. Joy cannot be paid for, but is a priceless treasure. As we hope for your arrival, as we pray for peace in your living, as we wait and watch and wonder how you might reveal yourself to us, give us joy in your advent, O oh God. Loving God, all of creation rejoices for you. 
For it was you who hung the stars and you who made our beating hearts. Thus, as we anticipate the birth of your son, fill our hearts not only with hope and peace, which we so desperately need, but also with joy. For when the nights feel too long and the darkness too strong, you light the way for us in your holy name we so gratefully pray. Amen. Our reading today comes from Acts chapter 5, starting at verse 27 and going up to 42. Um, As you can tell by the number, this is early in the book of Acts. So this is before the big missionary journeys of Paul, even before his conversion. This is early, early on in the infancy of this church. And they've been out preaching and teaching and healing and doing miracles and it's been amazing and the religious leaders are getting antsy because as you know if you've been following along with our Wednesday um, adult studies things are a little tense in Judea during this time there's the Romans have already violently suppressed some insurrections uh, peaceful or otherwise and the religious leaders in the temple are worried that any new movement might cause Rome to swoop in and take over everything and strip them of their power and it would be awful and they would be a part of then taken from what they have and they would be thrown down into the 90% of Judeans who lived in poverty. So they were a little antsy by this new church and so they arrested them as they did. But then um, they broke out of jail um, I mean, it's all, it's a wonderful holy story with an angel and all of that, but it's a jailbreak story. <laughs> There's a couple of them in the book of Acts. And so they can't find them. And then they do, you know, they return to the scene of the crime the way that a criminal does. And they're out there preaching again. It's important to note that they're preaching this gospel is breaking the law because it is blasphemy. And the Jewish law is the same thing as civil law. So their continuance of preaching 
is an act of civil disobedience. It is not just like the religious leaders don't want them to preach. It's they're not allowed to do this. <laughs> and yet here they are. And so they drag them before the council and they say, we told you not to preach. And when they had brought them, they had them stand before the council and the high priest questioned them saying, we gave you strict orders not to preach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teachings and you are determined to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior that he might give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to those things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Now, when they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill him. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, respected by all the people, stood up and ordered the men to be put outside for a short time. Then he said to them, fellow Israelites, consider carefully what you propose to do to these men. For some time ago, Theotis rose up claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. But he was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and disappeared. And after him, Judas the Galilean rose up at the time of the census and got people to follow him, and he also perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone, because if this plan or this undertaking is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is of God, then you will not be able to overthrow them. In that case, you may even be found fighting against God. Well, they were convinced by him. And when they had called in the apostles, they had them flogged for good measure. And they let them go. And then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus. As they left the council, they rejoiced that they were considered worthy to suffer dishonor for the sake of the name. And every day in the temple and at home, they did not cease to teach and proclaim Jesus as the Messiah. Oh, such cheeky apostles, aren't they? Here ends our reading. <laughs> oh. So earlier today, I mentioned how much I love Christmas music and how great it's been to record it and edit it and release it and sing it at home. Uh, we've been listening to Christmas music since uh, October. And why I want to tell you today a story about one of my favorite Christmas carols. And like all good Christmas carol stories, this one begins with an organ. Though unlike Silent Night, this organ was working. Like that was the whole point. This French uh, church got a new organ and that required a lot of work and money. And so they wanted to celebrate this new organ by having a Christmas song commissioned for its first use. And so the priest set out to find somebody who could write a good Christmas song. And so he hired a local one-handed wine merchant slash poet named Placida Capo. And he did it. And he wrote this poem, and it was great. It was amazing. It was such a good poem that instantly he was like, yes, we need to turn this into a song. But there was a catch about Placida, was that he was kind of an atheist and also a bit of a socialist, um, and was fairly antagonistic towards organized religion. But whatever, the song was really good. Well, the poem was really good. So forget that. We need to bring it to a musician. So Placida and, and the, the, the priest brought it to a mutual friend, a French composer um, by the name of Adolphe Adam, who took it and he wrote the music for it. And the music, I think, is the best part of this Christmas song. Um, it just moves me to tears every single time. Um, but there, there's a little catch with Adams as well, because he was, you know, Jewish. <laughs> so not really a big Jesus guy. 
But whatever, the music was great. The congregation loved it. The local churches heard it and were like, whoa, my goodness, this is the best Christmas song that I've ever heard. We need to sing it at our churches. And soon it was spreading throughout all of France. It was in every church the way that, you know, you walk into a grocery store and you hear Mariah Carey. That's what it was like in the mid-1800s in the south of France. Well, that is until the French church found out who had written it. Because, you know, for the bishops and all of that, knowing that this great Christmas song was written by an atheist and a Jew, well, didn't really fly with them. And so they banned it in every church in France. It was outlawed. You could get seriously in trouble if you sang this Christmas carol in churches, which you know, is a totally rational thing to do in this situation. So as you can imagine, the people didn't stop singing because when a song is this good, when it's this true, when it speaks so foundationally and fundamentally to the human condition and to the joy and the hope that comes from Christmas, I mean, it's just gonna keep going. There's something about, about a song or a piece of art or something or other that, that when it contains this much truth that resonates with people, it cannot be silenced. And so it, it, people were singing it in their homes and in their little private Bible studies and around the dining room table and maybe on a street corner when the bishop wasn't around. Can you imagine such a thing as an underground outlawed Christmas song? I love this so much. And now 12 years later, after this song had been, you know, kind of bubbling on the, the seedy underground of the, I don't know, the Christmas Carol black market, it found its way to the United States in a most unlikely place. A man named John Sullivan Dwight, who was the editor of a small music journal that reviewed classical music. Um, He had been a Unitarian minister for some time, but found himself getting such intense stage fright, speaking in front of people that he would get sick and vomit. He would have panic attacks every time he thought about preaching. And so he couldn't cut it as a preacher. And so he was editing this journal. He was writing this monthly article about the new and exciting world of classical music of the mid-1800s. And he came upon this song. And what drew him to this song was about how open and honest it was. A lot of our Christmas songs, especially the ones written back then, have this kind of pomp and circumstance to them. They use a lot of really fancy schmancy theological, biblical terms that we church insiders totally understand, but make it feel a little less relatable. But because this song was written by outsiders, they didn't know that church lingo. And so what they presented, this song, it, was, it just cut right through. Um, It was just so unique and so practical. It spoke to the issues that were going on in the mid-1800s. And what really got him, speaking of issues, was the third verse. Because the third verse of this Christmas song dealt with slavery. And at this point, it was 1855. So we're talking like 11 years, no, 10 years? Several years, seven When did the Civil War start? You're not here to tell me. It ended in the 60s. Anyway, several years before the Civil War. Someone's going to send me an email to let me know when the Civil War started. But it's right before that. And so you can imagine being an abolitionist in those days was uh, controversial and might get you in some trouble, especially if you were preaching it from the pulpit. So he loved the fact that the third verse of this song spoke out against slavery, because what kind of a Christmas carol takes a stand on some social issue like that, something that's like the most important social issue of the day? What? And, and it, 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 just like in France, swept the country. 
and people loved it and they sang it at Christmas. But because of this verse that was spoke out against slavery, it got banned in hundreds of churches throughout the South where slavery was legal. Um, and if it wasn't banned outright, the third verse was banned. So <laughs> what kind of Christmas carol carries with it such a scandalous power that cannot be stopped? Well, imagine, if you will, it's 1855. Slavery is still legal. Some of the people in your pews may own slaves. And even the people who don't own slaves at least benefit from the practice of slavery. So we're all kind of implicit in it in some way, shape, or form. It's kind of the mood that's in the air. And the organist starts playing a new Christmas carol, and you get to this third verse that says, Truly he taught us to love one another. His law is love, and his gospel is peace. Chains shall he break, for the slave is our brother, and in his name all oppression shall cease. Yes, that's right. O oh, holy night. The most deeply spiritual, immensely powerful, tears streaming down your face Christmas song ever written was written by an atheist and a Jew and has been banned in two countries. <laughs> but it will not be stopped because it's so true and it's so powerful. And it cuts through so much of the pomp and circumstance of the Christmas season and gets right down to the heart of why the birth of Christ really matters for us as individuals and for humanity as a whole. And anything that is so drenched in truth, it just, it can't be stopped. And isn't that the argument that the Pharisee Gamaliel gave to his colleagues when presented with uh, Peter and John and James and the apostles? We said basically, look guys, you and I all know there's been dozens of these messiahs in just in the past couple of years. There's probably a new one. They come onto the scene, they gather a following, but then once the charismatic leader gets killed and there's, you know, we cut the head off of the snake, everything else, they go away because there's nothing actually to this. It's just a charismatic leader taking advantage of people. And this one will probably do the same. But if it's true, then we're not going to be able to stop it anyway. And so we might as well just take a step back and wait and watch and see if this is true. And look, we're still talking about Jesus today. So he was on to something. And sometimes, friends, there are moments in history or movements or music or poems or art that is just so drenched in truth that it transcends itself and transports you into another plane. And when these moments come, we can either be like those French and American churches who try to outlaw it and ban it and pretend like it's not there and suppress it, or we can be like Gamaliel and we can let it breathe and let it show us whether or not it is true. And this moment in our lives, friends, this December of 2020 is one of those moments. Everything around us is just changing so quickly. I don't need to tell you that. Everything from the ways that we do church to the ways that we do business to the ways that we live our lives day to day. And things will be different even after this is all said and done. Because how could it not be? We will never get back to something. We will only move forward to something new. There's so many rituals and experiences and paradigms and institutional upheavals that it can be tempting in this moment in a search for some kind of certainty or clarity to try to pick out the things that are good and true and that will last now. We want to make sense of the chaos while we're still in it. But that's the thing about the chaos. You can't make sense of it until you're through it. So I want you to take some time this week, and I want you to practice something else. 
Because there are a lot of new ideas floating around right now. There's a lot of new practices floating around like right now. There's a lot of people trying to convince you that this way or that way is the future of the church or the family or the country or whatever. But Gamaliel teaches us that real, actual truth from God is made of different stuff than all this noise. The real, good, heavenly truth that is being born out of this confusing time will make itself clear when the dust settles. And you'll know that that was true because it will still be here. And Christ will still be here. And you will still be here. And Christ will still be here with you. Can you believe that today? Can you trust that God is in control of the chaos today? Can you trust that there is truth and goodness and growth being born into the storm that will make perfect sense once we're through it? If so, if God has given you the gift of faith, then rejoice today. Take a moment to just thank God for this heavenly gift, for the peace that you have that so many around you do not. If you're struggling to believe this, and you're grasping for faith right now, you really want to believe that God has this under control and that there is this kernel of truth that, is, that will be uh, born through this storm, then I want you to practice a simple but essential prayer. This is called a breath prayer. This is one of the most ancient sorts of prayers um, in the Christian tradition. It's called that because it's a single breath. It's not something that's filled with the pomp and circumstance of, of a long-winded prayer in which you explain to God all the reasons why you deserve the thing that you're asking for or even asking for specific things. It, it's not that kind of a prayer. It's the kind of a prayer that takes all of the weight, the tension, the confusion, the intense need, and presents it to God just as is. It's the kind of prayer that takes all of that, all of, all of those jumbles of feelings that you don't know how to deal with, and the prayer then serves as the suitcase for all of your baggage that you hand directly to God. The, the, um, the medieval mystic um, handbook um, called The Cloud of Unknowing <clears throat> says that when a person is drowning and they see a, a boat, that they don't yell and try to give some long-winded explanation of why they need help and how they need help and what sort of boat, what sort of life raft they need and what their name is. They don't do that. They take all of their fear, all of their anxiety, everything that is welling up within them, and it all gets expressed as a single help. And that prayer, that one word, is worth more than every single word you could have uttered in that moment. And that's the essence of a breath prayer. So I want you to use this as many times a day as you need to. Write it down somewhere so you'll remember to do it. Say it in your mind with every inhale and exhale during the day. Let this be the suitcase that holds your baggage to God. And you can use whatever words best express your need. The earliest ones that we have are simply um, the church used to, the ancient desert fathers used to say, Kyrie eleison, which means, Lord have mercy. But the one that I have found most helpful and valuable in these times is just simply Psalm 23. We inhale. The Lord is my shepherd. We exhale, I shall not want. Breathing in the promise of God's presence, 
and breathing out my need to have it all figured out. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I want to invite you to take a moment to simply breathe, inhale, and exhale. With every inhale, pray in your mind, the Lord is my shepherd. Inhale that promise into your very being. And then exhale, I shall not want. Letting go of your need to have it all figured out. We're going to take a few moments to practice. into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory
Christmas Day Their old familiar carols play And mild and sweet their songs repeat Of peace on earth, goodwill to men And the bells that ring Let us pray. With these gifts, dear God, accept the praise and thanksgiving of our hearts, which rejoice in your goodness and love. Let these gifts point to your presence in the world and further your hope for the world through Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Amen.
now, friends, take this benediction with you. May the love of God fill you until you overflow with joy. May the coming of the Christ child free you to live in an upside-down world. May the Holy Spirit empower you to work for the reign of God on earth. At Christmas and throughout the year, may you be inspired to share the good news of God's vision of peace and love. Amen. Go in peace.